Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson Sign. Happy Friday. Way back in the fall of 2017, CNN, believe it or not, ran a pretty interesting piece on its website. We read it. It was the story of a pizza delivery driver from Dearborn Heights, Michigan, called Khalil Abu Rayyan. At the age of 21, Ryan found himself deeply depressed and contemplating suicide. He poured out his feelings to strangers on the internet, as so many young people do. He posted pictures of himself at one point with a rifle, and then he suggested he might want to wage jihad. When he did that, out of the blue, he got a response from a woman he had never heard of called Dada. The two never actually met in person, but over time, a very intense relationship developed. Dada professed her love for Ryan. They courted online for weeks, and then one day, Gada started to stop writing. She simply disappeared. And then a new woman took her place. This woman began texting Ryan, too. Her name was Jana. Jana was not interested in romance. Jana wanted to wage violent jihad. She told Ryan that if he planned to kill himself, he might as well kill some infidels along with him. Quote, when it's jihad or when it's based on our creed or cause, that's the only time Allah allows it. That's what she wrote. Eventually, Ryan admitted to Jana that he had fantasized about killing people in the church near his pizza shop, though he stressed that he would never actually do it. In fact, he encouraged Jana not to hurt anyone. Days after he wrote that, the FBI swooped in and arrested Ryan, and that's when he learned that the women he'd been texting with didn't exist. Gada and Jana were fake. They were pure creations of the FBI. The Bureau had spent an entire year working to entrap a depressed pizza delivery boy and then created a honey trap to do it. But it still didn't work. After all of that, the Fed still did not have enough evidence to file terrorism charges against him. Nothing Ryan had said was criminal. He could have gone free, but they couldn't let him go free. That would be too embarrassing to the federal government. So they charged him with an absurd non-crime, unlawful possession of a firearm while under the influence of a controlled substance. He didn't shoot anyone or brandish the gun, he just had it. And for that, they sent him to prison for five years. In all, it was a thoroughly disgraceful chapter in the history of federal law enforcement, and CNN, to its credit, seemed to understand that at the time. The channel pointed out that the FBI often does more than stop crimes. Sometimes the FBI creates crimes. Quote, informants and agents don't always play the role of passive listener. They may offer the suspect the opportunity to participate in a fictitious terror plot replete with fake bombs and real guns. Court documents show. And indeed, court documents do show that, and it's wrong. A law enforcement agency should never encourage anyone to break the law. It's grotesque, and yet they routinely do that. CNN once admitted that that was happening and that it was a problem, but they won't admit it anymore. Earlier this week, we reported on this show that among those who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, there appear to be people who are working for the FBI. We didn't guess that. We concluded it based on the government's own court filing thanks to a piece in Revolver News. Dozens of suspects the FBI now says committed serious crimes on January 6th have not been charged with anything. They haven't even been identified. Why is that? Well, likely because they were in contact with the FBI before they committed those crimes. That is the definition of corruption. You're working for the FBI, so you're not charged for a crime. It's also, by the way, scary, given the current climate, given that January 6th is now being used as a pretext to strip law-abiding Americans of their most basic civil liberties. So given that, we have an absolute right to know exactly what happened that day and the FBI's role in it. Again, we believe the FBI had people on the ground, people who stormed the Capitol and committed crimes while inside. We said that. The FBI has not denied it. In fact, no one from the FBI has even commented on it. They don't have to, because this time they have CNN squarely on their side. Watch the apologists for corrupt federal law enforcement deny something they couldn't possibly be in a position to verify either way. But prepare yourself as you watch it. This is an appalling performance. And now it's the FBI. Tucker Carlson's newest baseless theory about the insurrection and how he is spreading it to millions of people. A new conspiracy theory is emerging about the attack on the U.S. Capitol. You hear this? <sighs> Directly from Hate TV. This is the beginning of a new effort to rewrite what happened on January 6th, even though it is wrong, and as you will hear from one of our analysts, impossibly wrong. And the whole crux of it is that this was an FBI insider 
operation. Uh, clearly untrue. Clearly untrue. Totally baseless. Let me say, again, it's insane to think that the FBI did this. <laughs> it's clearly untrue. It's totally wrong. All right, why do you explain how? They have almost two dozen people who've been identified as criminals who are not being charged. Why is that exactly? Why don't you tell us? But they didn't. And then just to make it totally obvious that CNN now functions as an arm of the woke national security state, which they do, the channel then invited on the former assistant director of the FBI, a man called Chris Swecker, to reassure viewers that the FBI did absolutely nothing wrong on January 6th. Not one bad thing. Trust us. And of course, CNN does trust the FBI. The FBI's word is good enough for CNN. The change here is bewildering. It seems like just the other day that CNN's own chief anchor was telling us the shocking story of the 2015 terror attack in Garland, Texas. That's the one in which an FBI agent texted the shooter words of encouragement. The FBI literally worked to make that shooting happen. It's not an exaggeration. We know that. An FBI agent was even present at the attack. Watch. It turns out the undercover agent did more than just communicate online with Elton Simpson. In an affidavit filed in another case, the government disclosed that the FBI undercover agent had actually traveled to Garland, Texas, and was present at the event. The undercover agent was in a car directly behind Elton Simpson and Nader Sufi when they started shooting. This cell phone photo of school security guard Bruce Joyner and police officer Greg Stevens was taken by the undercover agent seconds before the attack. The idea that he's taken photograph of the two people who happened to be attacked <laughs> moments before they're attacked is stunning. If you're wondering what happened to the FBI's undercover agent, he fled the scene, but was stopped at gunpoint by Garland police. This is video of him in handcuffs recorded by a local news crew. So tell us again how the FBI would never have anything to do with the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. What you just saw were some of the counterterrorism tactics that the FBI adopted after 9-11. All of us saw it happen. Now the Bureau has changed its focus. It's no longer going after Islamic extremism is now going after Joe Biden's political opponents. Those are the domestic terrorists they've been telling you about. This is a nightmare. It's a nightmare for civil liberties. It's a threat to democracy itself. We should have seen it coming. We did not see it coming, embarrassingly. Glenn Greenwald saw it coming. He's an independent journalist who writes on Substack, and he's going to join us in just a moment to explain what he thinks actually happened. In the meantime, though, the Biden administration is not waiting and has declared war on domestic terror. You may be in that category. We know because the administration has released a document called the National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism. It reads like a manual for targeting the administration's political opponents because that's exactly what it is. And if there's one story you should pay attention to this year, it's this one. It could affect you. Nicholas Giordano has studied the document. He studied a lot of American government documents. He's an associate professor of political science at Suffolk Community College and the host of the PA's report. He joins us now. Professor, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we want to talk to you Thank because you, you, unlike most people in the media, have actually read this document. This document comes from the White House. The first page has Joe Biden's signature on it. Tell us what it says and what it means. Well, this is actually one of the most concerning documents I've ever read that was authored by government officials. And when you look at it, it's clear that the analysts in the field, they didn't write this document. It was the political appointees trying to push an agenda. They list three factors that drive domestic terrorism. The first factor is racism. And when you look at it, they never really define racism except for white supremacy, of course, and the superiority of white race. And these are the same people that believe that racism is inherent. You're born with it. So if racism is inherent, the question is, are we born domestic terrorists? But it goes deeper than that. Then it talks about anti-government sentiment and anti-authority sentiment. And this is where it gets dangerous. The anti-government sentiment, if you call for a small, limited government, if you criticize the government in, way, in any way, are you going to be deemed as someone that has anti-government sentiment, anti-authority? If you question government powers, if you push back against the government, 
If you look at the coronavirus and you question the mandates that came out as unconstitutional, well, now you're classified as anti-authority. And just think back, over 1,200 public health officials a year ago signed a letter stating that if you protest lockdowns, that's white nationalism. So we have these big terms that are being used that really could encompass anything. In the document, it talks about violence. Now, we all abhor violence. Violence should not be tolerated in any way. But this document goes much further than that. It talks about incitement and what can incite domestic terrorism. And it doesn't give any explanation except for the fact that the government, the powers that be, will determine what incitement is. But on page 10, it talks about a few examples. If you question the 2020 election and bring up the idea of election fraud, if you talk about COVID and question the mandates that came out, or conspiracies, engage in what the government deems conspiracies, that could incite domestic terrorism, and therefore you can get punished for it. So if you put out a tweet talking about election fraud, are you now going to be targeted and labeled a domestic terrorist? So then the document lays out the four pillars and how it's going to combat, push back against domestic terrorism. You see widespread monitoring of American civilians. You see a partnership with big tech, the financial sector, to give up Americans' private information. You see censorship. It talks about the supply and demand of information online, and that means that it has to limit it through censorship. It talks about encouraging individuals and families, trying to recruit them. And when we look at that, well, what do they mean by that? I remember in Vermont when a governor tried to do that. So we see these abuses take place, but it's a political agenda. That's what's being pushed. And Pillow 4 talks about the agenda of pushing it for gun violence and CRT and equity. It's a fascist document. I mean, I, I, that's what you're describing. And they're pushing the country towards something awful. This country was very divided on election day. They've made it still more divided. And it's, it's, I think it's starting to scare people, including me. That's for sure. Nicholas Giordano, Professor, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. We're going to take Glenn Greenwald a little later in the show, but first, one of the basic duties of any state government, of course, is to keep the lights on. Power, energy, you know how you run your life? California can't do that. California doesn't have a functioning government. They just announced some very bad news for people who live there. I'll tell you what it is next.